Um, my name is Helena Kennedy, um, and uh, I'm going to chair this session. I'm a lawyer, and I'm, uh, I have written and uh, acted in many cases involving women's rights over, I'm almost embarrassed to say this, but next year I will have practiced at the bar for 50 years. <laughs> anyway, there you are. Don't, don't tell anybody. <laughs> Anyway, I'm, I'm getting very aged, um, and, it, and one of the great frustrations of my life is that when I was the age of most of you, I somehow imagined that by, t by the time I got to the age that I now am, that we would have somehow uh, got to a better place than we've got to on the issue of women's rights, on the ways in which the criminal justice system in which I've worked for, for all of my professional life. I thought that we would have made more gains than we have, and it is a scandal that we haven't. Um, so, we have a marvellous group of people here on the stage. Um, they are the most amazing, um, skilled um, and knowledgeable folks. And I'm just going to say to all of you, first of all, there's a number of, sort of ground rules that we have to run by, which is that um, you know, time is of the essence, and so um, there's a turnaround business at the end. So, um, I'm, I'm going to have to hold people to quite tight timing. Um, but um, forgive me for that, but it's just the, the way of things. The other thing is that we are talking about um, issues that are very um, emotionally sensitive and hard, and so um, if any of you are, are feeling that you have your own story to tell, it may be that this room is not the best place to do that, and there is the wonderful fact that we have great um, people who are skilled therapists here today who are um, present downstairs, um, apparently in the great hall at the marketplace there, and um, they are from the Survivors Trust, and if any of you want to talk about experiences you've had, they would be very willing to, to be available to you. And, uh, and apparently, um, on our program list somewhere at the back, I haven't examined it all uh, as carefully as that, but there are lists of organisations that are helpful in addressing some of these issues. Now, I, I just wanted to start by saying that um, the issue of shame, I wrote many years ago, um, before many of you were even born, I wrote a book um, called Eve Was uh, Framed. Um, framed because of the whole way in which um, women end up getting, getting blamed um, for uh, the conduct of men. And that, that was one of the lessons that I learned very early as a young practitioner at the bar. Um, at the time where I had joined the women's movement in the early 70s, I started practicing in almost at the same sort of time and started looking at the law through a particular lens, which was the lens of being a, a, a woman, a feminist, um, who wanted you know, justice for women. And, um, and what, it, what became very clear to me was the way in which um, uh, uh, women were being judged, that when j women were, the, were at the receiving end of transgressions of all kinds, that somehow or other women were measured by different standards. And part of that business is, and, and I, I recently, I, over the decades, have re up, brought up to date, Eve was framed, the book. Um, and when I came to do it um, in 2017, um, I was, my publishers were pushing me and saying, you know, there's so much going on and very little gains, what are we going to do? And I said, well, we'll, we'll bring it up to date. And, um, and I, I couldn't bring it up to date because so much was happening. And, and I, I was filled with rage. And I called the, the, the newest version of it, Eve was shamed, not Eve was framed. I changed the name. And because lots of you all thought, well, well I've read that book, I've read it 20 years ago, um, we discovered that it was better to actually give it a, a completely different title. And in paperback, it's called Miss Justice. And what I was trying to deal with in the business of changing that name and introducing the word shame was that shame is the burden that women carry in relation to all of this. And it starts because of the way in which shame is used as a way of controlling women. And be very clear of that. It's about making us feel that our sexuality is something to be uh, uh, sh sh ashamed of, and that if we are women who in any way are deemed to be inappropriate, or where our conduct does not measure up to some bizarre standard, um, then we are uh, measured as failing. And, uh, and that's what so much of the criminal justice system is measured around. And I have to say to all of you that it is not just in the United Kingdom. It's around the world. 
I, don't, I can't think of any place where it's any different. And I remember going as, a, as a, um, an, in, an independent assessor to look at um, program, projects that were set up after the, the um, abysmal business of the invasion of Iraq. And, um, and I went to a prison because there were the, this was about the generality of human rights. It's one of the things that I now do in my international work. And so I was sent to measure up to see whether these, these you know, programs of change were, were really working. And I went to a prison, and it was purely by accident, by asking a question of saying, what, um, are, are there women's prisons? And somebody said, well, there's women in this prison. Oh, really? Could I see the, meet with the women who are in this prison? And they all got very sh shirty and shifty. And, uh, and I insisted that I wanted to meet with the women. And of course, there was no exercise yard. The, the women were in a sort of dark hovel. And, um, and when I qu questioned what they were there for, I discovered that they were virtually every single one was there for a morality offence, that there are crimes of a moral nature, and it was of a nonsense, you know, that if they were seen in a way uh, talking to a man without the guardian there, um, uh, holding hands with somebody, all manner of, of low-level offending. Um, and um, these women were in prison for it, and often because of the dishonour families meant, they would have no family to go back to. And I remember one of them had a, in this uh, prison shed, there was a little girl who was about three, and, uh, and she was the blonde-haired and blue-eyed, and uh, she was the child, in fact, of, uh, of uh, a relationship that this young woman had had with a, a, a GI. Um, who in the in the years before, and uh, and all these women were caring for this child, and I said, a, this, a prison's not the place for a child, and I remember them saying, the family will not have this child, and nobody else will have this child, and the chances are that if we make a complaint about the presence of this child in this prison, she'll end up being trafficked, and so. I had to sort of turn the page and walk out of that prison, um, reporting on the conditions of women and so on, but making no reference to the fact that there was a child there because the alternatives for that child were so dire that in fact being there was probably better for her. You know, the world is filled with these kinds of judgments of women. And so um, we're very lucky to have the group that we have today and to take this conversation into the courts here in Britain. And so let me introduce to you, and I'm going to ask my uh, wonderful panel to wave when I uh, refer to them. Um, Alex, Alex Fangranel, where, where are I? Alex, yes, wave. Um, Alex is uh, an, a, a real uh, expert um, in the whole business of sexuality and consent and uh, BDSM. And she's uh, an associate professor of criminology. And, uh, and uh, uh, we were rem remembered that we had met on a number of these kinds of occasions before. I have to tell you that that's what happens when you um, uh, delve into this work. You, you, there are some of us who um, have been doing it for so many years. Um, I have also with me Mandu Reid, probably well known to many of you, who is the leader of the Equality Party, who has stood um, uh, for election, who has really put on the, onto the agenda so many of the issues affecting women. And, uh, and one of its purposes is to really to hold the other parties to account um, and to really rattle the, the bars of our political cages. Mandu is a, a force to be reckoned with, and it's great to have you here again, Mandy, to see you. Um, Professor Amina uh, Menon is here with us, and she is the director, Amina, can you give a wee wave, yeah, director of the Centre for the Study of Emotion and Law at Royal Holloway. And, um, and, the, and, the, and the, the real problem is that the law is pretty, pretty incompetent and incapable of dealing with real emotion. And, uh, and my next person, I'm going to introduce you to Charlotte Proudman, a barrister, uh, um, an expert in gender-based violence. She's written a great book, which you haven't all seen yet, but I have, um, which is at FGM on FGM, and it's really looking at uh, that, that whole... Uh, business and its impact on women's lives and women's sexuality, and um, I got a, a pre a pre read ahead of other people, and it is a really great book. Um, and now um, Tashmia Owen, um, who's uh, who's a, a visual arts expert, a writer, a campaigner, a script uh, writer. Um, she um, explores the whole lives experiences of women of color, 
And into this discussion, that we have to recognise that that intersectionality is at its heart. That that you know the things that are experienced by the women who are in the, if you like, in the dominant class in our society, experience it differently from people who are. Um, uh, of people from ethnic minorities, people who have disabilities, people who have uh, uh, who are gay, people who have di people of difference at all, and 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 those things, multiple discriminations, make for um, even more uh, treachery within the um, uh, criminal justice system, and so it's very important for us to be v very aware and alert and conscious of of, that, of those differences. So um, I want to uh, kick off by actually asking my um, wonderful panel if they might just very quickly, and I'm going to be very ruthless. Um, I'm going to be like Stalin's granny um, in my fierce way of controlling this. So can I ask um, Alex, first of all, if you might just give us a little kick off about your um, contribution to this discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here as well to join us in this really important discussion. Um, one of the things which um, uh, propelled me to want to like, come to this discussion is the... Uh, is, is a tension that I've seen in my, in my research and my work around the relationship between um, sexual pleasure, desire, risk-taking, and how that is encountered by a criminal justice system, which I think, we're, we're, hopefully we'll be able to dis uh, unpack this a bit more as we go through our discussion, adopts almost a false sex-positive perspective on some cases where women come or not necessarily women, because in the cases which I've been looking at most recently, the women in question are dead. Women's, uh, cases in which women have been killed as parts of, con of apparently conceptual sex games gone wrong. Um, the way in which those cases are, are, um, are argued about and then discussed and judged, the language and the way in which those, the, the acts in those instances are figured are um, mobilize a sense of false sex positivity where uh, a sense that um, women's rights and agency to sexual expression should be recognized, which is absolutely the case, but that it's strategically mobilized in order to paint a picture of vi sexual violence uh, which is able to hide under a guise of consent. And so what I've been looking at what, and what I think is really important, one of the things we should, we should talk about is the ways in which the, um, uh, we think about the criminal justice system as party to the contemporary rape culture in which this sort of thing is able to happen, or maybe even a crucible through which those things are enacted. And so um, my, my work is much more about rape culture more broadly. I don't think the law can save us, so that's something which uh, I can put my step from my stall out there right at the beginning. But um, what I think is really important is that it is such an it's such a significant part of the way in which we live our lives and the, the structure and problems that we come across. So we have to engage with it. It has to do something, but it, w will it save us? I'm not sure. I, thank you very much, and thank you so much for sticking so much to time. But I mean, Alex, Alex is really raising something very important, and uh, um, and it's something that's been going on in the courts for for too long, um, which is this business of saying um, uh, she wanted rough sex. Uh, it's the rough sex defence, you know, and it happens in in rape when when there is there is clear physical um, evidence of, uh, of of violence, um, uh, where it's all claimed that even that is with consent, and uh, and also in the cases where women end up dead, where the claim is she wanted me to strangle her, uh, and so um, some of the changes in the law recently around. Um, uh, uh, that business of, of uh, strangulation is, uh, uh, is now being addressed, and I'm going to get Alex to just uh, deal with that. What, what do, you, do you think that the, cha the recent change in the law in the Domestic Abuse Act, um, introducing a, a particular offence, which is about um, mm -hmm. um, really strangulation in, in sex, what, what, I mean, I mean... Yeah, I mean, so what the, one of the issues I see with that is that this, the um, enshrining in, in uh, the Domestic Abuse Act, the, like, the fact that it is illegal to participate in the, to consent to these things, that was already, already always the law from, straight from the, uh, the Brown case of the dates escaped me, but we're going to go with the 94, something like that. Yeah. And so it's always been the case that, you, that, I mean, problematically or not, and that's also a debate which I have outside of this context for people who practice consensual BDSM. Um, it's always been something which was not, uh, you, that, you, that people couldn't consent to. So uh, the, uh, the addition of this clarifies perhaps the position which was already, which was already um, in place. But uh, given that 
notwithstanding the fact that it has always been illegal to, to strangle someone, even if they've asked to, to be strangled, um, even though that has always been the case, it hasn't, it hasn't stopped the uh, rate, and the, in, including the increased rate of women uh, being seriously injured or killed um, in circumstances where that is claimed to have happened. So it's not clear to me that that would necessarily bring about the change that it's expected to because it's layered upon a context where um, those... That, that those sorts of, these, these sorts of sexual practices have become, or a version of them, has problematically become normalised. And so, um, yeah, I'm less optimistic about that. Okay. Um, I just wanted uh, to say, always start from the assumption of no knowledge. BDSM? Sorry. What, <laughs> tell, tell people what Yeah, so sorry. Um, the B BDSM stands for bondage, uh, domination, and sadomasochism. And so it describes eroticized power play in a sexual context. And one of the key tenets of it is that it's a consensual act. There are other key tenets of it, but at its heart, consent is, is central to um, these sort of sexual, sexual practices. And um, what distinguishes it from sexual violence uh, is consent. And so people uh, can uh, participate in BDSM consensually, very pleasurably, for, people, for practitioners of BDSM, it's an inherent part of their sexuality. So the, 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 their sexual citizenship rights to practice it are necessarily menaced by a legal system which criminalizes many aspects of BDSM. But, that doesn't, that, but at the same time, with the other hand, what we see is like a generalized acceptance that BDSM happens and that people should be allowed to consent to things. And so therefore, because this may have happened, actually, <clears throat> we're going to downgrade murder to manslaughter or finally find something to be, have been an accident. So uh, it, has, it has significant material effects on justice outcomes. And for, for any of you um, who are not lawyers in here, and that's probably the majority of you, the, uh, there was a very famous case in the 90s which involved um, homosexual sadomasochistic sex in which people seemed to uh, enjoy nailing each other's penises to the floor and, uh, and, uh, and, and said it was consensual. And, um, and the, eventually the, our highest court, which was the House of Lords Committee, a, you know, uh, appellate committee, um, decided that, that certain things um, even if consensual, would be um, against the public interest. Um, and, um, and there was a lot of controversy over the decision, but they, dis they said that there were certain things within the context of, uh, particularly of sexual activity, where um, uh, sort of consent um, was actually no, no defense because they were sort of against the interests of, uh, of the, 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 the humanity of the individual, the human dignity of the individual. Anyway, I, I, um, Charlotte, I'm going to take over to you because you're a practitioner of the law and in the courts um, uh, regularly just now. And, uh, and, and perhaps you might talk, like to talk about the shaming aspect of this, of, of, of how women going to the, to, the, to the legal system, to the police, um, to the prosecutorial system with an allegation of rape, how that's dealt with and why it is that we are, are facing this absolutely abysmal business where... Um, it's almost as if um, uh, rape has been decriminalised. Yeah, so I, I wanted to start actually by saying and, and, and asking you a question. Has rape become decriminalised? We know that 85,000 women and girls are raped um, every year in England and Wales alone. And in the year of 2020, just over 1,000 uh, rapes resulted in a conviction, which is absolutely astounding. Uh, given those soaring uh, levels of rape. And, and why is that? Why is it that 60 men in the UK have killed women during so-called rough sex and not one woman has killed a man during rough sex? These are gender-based crimes. They are violence against women and girls. And yet our system, in my view, is ingrained with institutional misogyny right from the outset when a woman bravely and courageously goes to the police to report rape or sexual assault. And then they're met often with a disbelief and they feel that their history is put on trial, who they've slept with, whether they enjoy rough sex, whether they've had consensual sex with the same perpetrator who they're now accusing of rape. They are put on trial. And how many women want to go through this? Many say to me that they feel that they're being re-victimized and they feel it's re-traumatizing. And I wanted to share with you one example of a case 
uh, which I looked at. I looked at the police disclosure of this case. I've removed any details so you wouldn't know who they are. But this, in my view, is a fairly classic example of how the police deal with such cases. So in the police report, they put evidential difficulties. One, no CCTV. Not surprising when you consider that the alleged rape was in a, a partnership over a number of years with repeated rapes. Number two, uh, the complainant sub substantially lacks any detail of alleged multiple incidents. No recognition of the amount of trauma that she might have experienced over an enduring relationship of rape, domestic abuse, and coercive and controlling behavior. Number three, no independent witnesses. Well, how many people would you imagine are in a bedroom or wherever in the flat observing the fact that they're being raped? I mean, it's beggar's belief. And then, of course, you have the fact that, you know, no one's walking around wearing body cam footage, but they somehow expect that they are. Number four, late reporting, so there are no forensics. I mean, good grief, you just sort of give up after a while, don't you? Um, conversations between the parties, because, of course, they've trawled through their social media, Facebook messages, text messages, you name it. Uh, supplied, which suggests that the complainant wants to remain in a relationship with the perpetrator. We all know how difficult it is, if not impossible, for women to escape abusive relationships. This is not uncommon and can be, for example, Stockholm Syndrome, amongst other forms of traumatization. Character of the complainant is called into question, as messages are received between a friend, which suggests a tendency to potentially exaggerate what on earth these messages are, not even in the context of rape, just general messages and chit-chat between a friend. Uh, and then it goes on, this is the final one, uh, that the suspect during the interview stated that all sexual activity was consensual. This is a word against word investigation. It's a he said, she said. What a surprise. This is most rape investigations. We know how this works. The police lack not only the resources, but the skill, the training, the understanding to be able to properly investigate rape complaints. And then, as Helena and others know, when it finally does arrive at court, well, then that's a, a whole different ball game. And we see these tropes, stereotypes played out. She was asking for it. She was wearing a short skirt. She enjoyed sex on these occasions. Therefore, it's implied that she consented on other occasions. Cross-examination can go on for over a day, sometimes even longer. It's a horrendous process to go through. And one may even question where the, sometimes the trials, which I've seen, it's like watching sometimes a wounded animal uh, being continually beaten over and over again in a courtroom context. And someone spoke on the earlier panel about uh, survivor porn. What we often see is rape victims porn in the way in which a rape trial is presented in the court. It becomes almost pornographic and every single intimate detail and personal nature of that rape is laid bare for the public to see. So thinking about the whole courtroom process, does that amount to an Article 3 breach? Is it torture? Is it in inhumane treatment? And is our public system, the court, continuing and repeating that trauma? Charlotte, it, uh, it beggars belief, some of, the, some of that, um, because it was going on when, uh, when I was young, and it's going on, here we are, you know, nearly 50 years later. It's just, it's just perennial. Um, at Mandu. Um, first of all, <coughs> I want to start by saying I think it's really important that we're having this conversation. Um, what you've outlined, Charlotte, 85,000 cases in England and Wales. I think when you add in Northern Ireland and Scotland, we're talking about 100,000. I think that's a conservative estimate. That's 11 women raped every hour. So this panel's going to last for just over an hour. You do the maths. Um, it's important we're having this conversation, though, because that status quo, that 100,000, is not, as was discussed on the previous panel, an inevitability. It doesn't need to be an inevitability, and we can't allow it to be an inevitability. But shame, stigma, and silence around these issues, those three things are foot soldiers of that status quo. 
And it is our job, it is our job, it is our duty, it is our calling to challenge and tackle that. Um, we've spoken already briefly about institutional dysfunction if we're talking about the legal system. We've talked about women being failed, we've talked about the police because the criminal justice system is, is, a, is a long tunnel in a way you've got the front end with, with the police and it goes all the way up to the judiciary and, and the statute, what's actually written in law. There's a lot of work to do but we have to remember that we can make changes to the law, and I believe in pursuing that. I do agree, Alex, that the law won't save us. The reason why it won't save us, though, is because the institutions that we're talking about are microcosms of our society. The biases, the misogyny, um, all that stuff that kind of creates the dysfunction stems from what's going on in society. And for, the, for this reason, the fact that this issue is so widespread, the fact that we're talking about institutional dysfunction, stereotypes, cultural, <laughs> attitudinal, behavioral issues, tell me that this is political. Action is needed across so many different spheres that the only way you can really mobilize that action is via uh, getting a formidable and meaningful response from the political process. And that's why I always say this will be, for as long as it needs to be, a central plank of, of what the Women's Equality Party does. When we're talking about those numbers, though, I want to go a tiny bit granular because it's really important that stuff can get forgotten. Um, disabled women, twice as likely to be victims of sexual assault as compared to non-disabled women. Black women, twice as likely to be victims of rape as compared to white women. Mixed race women, four times as likely as compared to white women to be victims of rape. It's really important we look at that granular stuff. A friend of mine from Brazil said in the part of the country she comes from, they have this saying that's very well known. Um, and it goes something like this. It's pretty horrendous, but this is how it goes. Um, white women are for marriage. Mixed race women are for fucking. And black women are for work. And this is why, what that illustrates to me is how we can talk about the legal system, but we cannot decouple that from what's going on in society more broadly and the change we need, which must be driven by political action in order to precipitate a world where none of us, none of the, the girls who are coming after us have to put up with this, have to inherit it. So expect, demand of your politicians, any political party you support, support mine for goodness sake because we're definitely always gonna have this front and center for as long as we need to. That is a way for us to drive change across all the different levels and the shame that has constrained us for so long is something that the system itself relies on. The status quo relies yeah. on our shame. So I'll leave it there for now but I'm sure Thank we can you, explore Mandy. some of those themes further. And, and, that, and that is really at the heart of this, is the idea that the shame is really something that is so deeply ingrained. Yeah. Um, so that, that when women um, uh, experience um, abuse, so at the receiving end of things that um, are about uh, um, in male entitlement, and it's often, I'm afraid, um, uh, uh, expressed in that way, um, uh, that um, the, it's women who carry the burden of, of feeling shame. Um, that they somehow brought it on their own heads. And from a very early age, children, if, you're te if we're teaching our, our nine and 10 year olds um, self safeguarding, which is what, what ends up happening, you know, be, beware at night, don't, be, don't, don't come home late from school, don't go, be, come back with your friend, don't go off on your own to that bit of the park, uh, don't take shortcuts, uh, don't talk to strangers. All of that messaging is saying, but if you do and something happens to you, then of course it's your own fault because you didn't do it by the rules. And so girls are receiving this messaging from a very, very early age. And we end up being sort of, you know, experts in risk assessing, um, you know, because, because it's what we're taught from such a young age. And, uh, and so I just, I just feel that that business of um, feeling that there is somehow a, a, a guilt to be associated with being the person who's at the receiving end of transgression is, um, is something that we really have to confront. And uh, Amina Memon is um, uh, here to uh, talk about um, her work, which is around this kind of offending. Yeah, so um, I study memory and decision making and I've been working on police interviewing techniques for well over 30 years now. And um, one of the issues that Charlotte raised and I did put it in context, in the political context is 
for many years now, based on evidence and research, we do know how to gather information and evidence appropriately from victims and witnesses. Um, we know how to do that without introducing bias. Those techniques are out there. I developed the best practice guidance in Scotland, which was based on the English guidance that's been out there since 1992. Many of us have been working in an interdisciplinary context, doing training, training police and social work. But what we don't have is this a culture um, we, what we haven't got rid of is a culture of disbelief when it comes to uh, victims of rape in particular. So we're seeing constantly their credibility being challenged. So we've heard a number of statistics today. We know 1% to 3% of convictions only. Why is that? 57% of victims withdraw their cases when they enter that tunnel. Mm -hmm. As many as that. Why is that? Obviously, it's, it's re-traumatizing. Charlotte's already talked about it. We call it secondary victimization. Um, and that's not just the individual that's being victimized. It's their friends, their family, the whole institution, perhaps, that they work in. So we know that's a barrier. But also, what are the other reasons? Not, be, not feeling believed, being judged because you're showing emotion or you're not showing emotion, um, being judged because you're not providing that detailed report well, detail isn't an indicator of whether your memory is reliable or not. It's just an indicator of credibility. And why should somebody's belief about whether you're responsible for the crime or somebody's myth that so you must have done something or you gave consent, why should that make, why should that make a police officer and then the CPS decide this isn't a case worth pursuing. We know there's a lot of political concerns about the fact that the CPS are only filtering through those cases that they think, they believe, can result in a conviction. We do have a system, we have an adversarial system where you have to hear from both sides. But when it comes to questioning, what I'm seeing is that there are very good techniques for having witness-centered victim-centered interviews where you put the needs of the victim first. It's only recently that we've updated the guidance for the provision of therapy, therapeutic support. There was always a concern that if a victim's undergoing therapy, it might contaminate the evidence that yeah. that person provides, which has been a real barrier. And only in the last couple of years have they thought about, and even then there's a concern that therapist records may be disclosed, but at the same time, we need to look at how, and of course, there's a whole issue of intersectionality, which has been touched on many, many times. We're only just beginning to understand how multiple characters, race, poverty, gender, class, class, social class, affect. And, and, and this is an area that we just don't understand. And when it comes to rape myths, and myths do inf inform people's judgments, unconscious bias does influence, and there's been one one comprehensive study looking at how jurors perceive evidence in these trials and it actually concluded there were no rape myths but when you look at the detail of the work it, it's obvious that people were responding in a socially desirable manner in those sorts of studies so we know that there, there are these inherent biases and so it's not just a case of knowing and being able to give the evidence it's it's how that evidence is interpreted and it's been a real challenge as a psychologist trying to work in <laughs> with lawyers and within the legal system and especially when we did our developed our training in the 90s we just couldn't get it to the cps knocked on so many i've knocked on so many doors and <laughs> i mean i was a lecturer at the time and it's not made any difference being a professor now i mean partly yes po possibly being fe female and black hasn't helped me and i have to say that um but but it, it's not through not trying. There's just so much more that needs to be done. And in a way, it's, I want to be optimistic, but it's frustrating for someone like myself who went into this area really believing as a PhD student that I could make a difference. And yet here we are still talking about 30 years later, the same rates of prosecution. And we know we've got more victims coming forward. And, yeah. Yeah. and we know the training is there. And we've also developed training to address vulnerability, disability. We've got all that. I mean, we've got a fantastic um, vulnerable witness training program that's out there. Intersectionality, not so much, but we, have, we do have these resources. So what's gone wrong? Well, one of the things that undoubtedly has not been helpful has been the arrival of social media. Um, I mean, let's be very clear, while social media has been, um, on the one hand, 
Um, certainly after the Me Too, you know, when, when, when the whole business of Harvey Weinstein hit the fan and, uh, and the Me Too movement got, you know, really was, it was like wildfire across the world. It was a kind of wonderful thing that there was this communication that women were not going to be silenced anymore and so on. And I felt that that was, that then, you know, social media had a, a, a purpose and a sense. Um, and, uh, and also, um, what was interesting was, for me, was that the idea that um, women were somehow had another way. Um, uh, it was quite frightening to the, to the, 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 if you like, the institutions, because women were throwing a brick through the windows of the criminal justice systems around the world. They were saying, your systems, you tell us that we're supposed to bring our wrongs to the courts, and when we try to do that, we just get shafted. So why, why, why should we do it? We're just going to call folk out on, on social media and, uh, and name and shame them for the things that they do to us. And so, um, uh, and of course, then everybody got very alarmed. Um, and uh, so, so at that point, it seemed as though social media had a real sort of benefit to us as women. Um, and certainly, and, and I would say this for anybody who's been victimized, and that can be men too. Uh, certainly boys um, um, can be predated on in, in similar ways. But, um, but the interesting thing now is that, um, uh, that, that for me, the business of, of social media has been a megaphone for the ugliest forms of misogyny and has actually given permission for that to actually then be translated into conduct in other arenas, in, in the street and in the bedroom and wherever. And, um, and women are, the, therefore, is, it, is, it is worse. It is worse, and it's worse because I think a megaphone has been given to uh, to abusers, and uh, and not just a megaphone, um, but a kind of way in which they 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 see and watch this you know pornography that pops up all the time on their phones um, from the earliest of ages, and it degrades and uh, and uh, um, presents women in ways that uh, are absolutely um, uh, then translated into the conduct that women are exposed to. So I, I do feel that social media has been an absolutely hideous invention, and I wish it had never come along. And I, uh, and that's, that, 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 that I say this. I mean, I say this because, I, let's go back to its beginnings. Let's remember that Zuckerberg wanted it. What was Facebook about? It was about pulling women. It was about, it was about rating women. You know, do we think that they look good or not good? And who do you want to fuck and who do you not want to? It was a horrible, the origins of it tell you everything. And it has fulfilled a horrible promise in terms of objectification of women and so on. So, I mean, for me, I wish it had never happened. And, and, uh, and there's a place in hell for Zuckerberg. Anyway, um, <laughs> so um, over, over, over now to Tashmia. Um, because you're in the creative world, you're, you, you, you find ways of bringing this um, 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 home to us all. Talk to us. Um, yeah, okay. I, I definitely agree. I think this is political. Mm -hmm. I personally feel like the systems in place are doing exactly what they were designed to do. Mm -hmm. um, today, on this panel, I'm here to speak uh, as a survivor, um, coming freshly out of, just three weeks ago, a criminal investigation myself um, for rape. Uh, and for what I experienced at the hands of the police and the CPS and my assailants, there were two, and how they employed the state apparatus against me, the police, my children's school, social services. Um, yeah, how I was re-victimized repeatedly for the whole year as an intimidation campaign, I suppose, to drop the case because I had reported it. Um, so, yeah, today I'm coming from that aspect. Well, we're, we're, yeah. we're with you. Everyone in this audience is with you. I'm, I'm sorry you've been through all of that. It's terrible. <laughs> but talk to us about it. Yeah. I mean, I mean um, if you feel comfortable yeah. doing so. But um, you've been through that, and the, and the, fu the full horror of uh, your experience is about uh, the failure of a system to provide justice for women. Yes. And, and it is about the fact that you were um, um, being sort of, if you like, brushed away, but yes. also um, um, in the course of that being treated as lesser. Yes. Um, from the moment I reported it, um, one of the assailants was well known to me, was a friend, or I believe to be a friend. Um, that seemed to have a huge impact 
or bearing on how the police heard what I was saying um, and around the whole aspect of consent and whether I had genuinely consented to this and changed my mind and so had played a part in this in somehow. Even though if I had changed my mind, I right, should be able to change my mind. That yeah. should be absolutely, yeah. Um, one of my assailants is a public figure and well-known and that also played a part in how the police perceived it. Um, they seemed to think that I was doing it for attention and would somehow receive some, I'm not even sure what, because as a rape, you don't, you don't receive an award, nothing, nothing, you don't get, you don't, you know, you don't become Monica Lewinsky, you don't get a big, you know, Vogue spread or something, I'm not, I'm not these sure aren't. Visit, want to visit her no, else no, exactly. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure what they feel happens because I can't see any cases where this has happened. Um, so I, I, I was met by disbelief from the get-go um, to the point that I felt like they were investigating me and the police were very much talking to one of my assailants as if they were apologizing for my behavior and for the trouble I was causing this assailant and how they knew they had important work to do and this nobody had come out of nowhere and tried to create something. Um, one of my assailants immediately took to social media um, to speak about me. O over a period of a year, I lost work, I lost friends. The police, <laughs> their exact words were, when this person speaks on social media, it's as though they're speaking in their living room to their friends. It is none of your business what they say about you, and it doesn't impact you. I'm not sure how somebody who has thousands and thousands of followers is speaking in their living room. What size living room is this that they're speaking in? It just doesn't, to me, make any sense. Um, I also had, in terms of the injuries I had, I went to the police forensic unit afterwards, had quite a lot of tests done. They had to check that my spinal cord was okay because of the amount of strangulation that had occurred. Um, a police officer told me, or the detective, that he felt that I had consented to it and lots of people like being strangled. Um, despite me saying that I hadn't, they still insisted I had forgotten that I had consented. Um, so yeah, I, I, every aspect, they, I, the social services looked into my children, how I look after my children, if my children were safe, was I a good mother? At the school, they started questioning whether I was a safe mother because of what my assailants were doing, as well as the police response, because they suddenly started treating me as if I was mentally unstable and I had imagined the situation. Um, I was, it was a night out with friends um, just in between two lockdowns that also was held against me by the police because they said, why would you be out during COVID despite the fact that it was a ticketed event, it was a legal event, it was, we were all tested. Um, I had been shielding because I was just coming out of cancer treatment and um, that as well was questioned whether my cancer had been real. Um, <laughs> It's the most horrifying and terrible story, um, and uh, I, I'm, I'm, thank you for sharing it with us. That's really we know how hard it must be to do that. Um, but what what it, what it shows is the deep misogyny that exists within our policing forces, yes, um, within the systems itself that are supposed to be investigatory, and it's part of the problem here is about how you address that stuff when it's so deeply embedded. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I just. Uh, I'm going to now, um, because 
time is of the essence, and I keep getting a little signals. <laughs> um, and so I want, I want this to be an opportunity for all of you to interact. Can you ask questions uh, so that I'll try and get answers? Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning, um, you know, we've had um, um, a really horrible story being told about, about the failure of investigation, and I'm sure that there must be in this audience many people who could tell um, stories that are also about failures of investigation. Um, can, we, can we kind of try and stick it to questions rather than um, recounting a, a, an, a, a, an experience? Thank you. Is it Pete? Um, I'm really glad to get this chance because I'm a survivor of childhood sexual abuse and outbreak. And I entered the mental health system in my 40s because of familial tainted genes. Oh, yeah. I was given a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. And I was horrified at the time because, the, you know, to discover um, the misogyny uh, of psychiatric diagnosis, the psychiatric Things that I've over the years written, I mean, because I've been writing about this stuff even before um, I had published Evil Strange, which was in 1992, um, but, but through the 80s, writing about this stuff, which was that we, we started off saying, you know, um, that the courts would bring up sort of sexual history and be cross examining people about sexual history, but actually, one of the, the, the things that once that was sort of uh, identified as being part of the problem, what was, what was not dealt with in all that was the pathologizing of women by actually looking through their history to see if you at any stage had had anything that indicated that you might have gone to a therapist, gone to counseling, gone to for help about anything in your life. And so, you know, we knew that w women were, ended up being, you know, asked that with the, the defense asking to see medical records and all kinds of things. And you could have been a student who, got, you know, got depressed over your exams and suddenly you were, your, your uh, mental history was being looked at. And, uh, and you were being cross-examined as to whether you know, it made you somebody who was a bit fragile and perhaps um, not always fully in touch with what was going on, and all, all sorts of stuff with sort of pseudo-psychology entering the courtroom. And, uh, and that's been one of the shocking things as, as a way of undermining the credibility of women and, uh, and using that, uh, that sort of material. But, but what you're describing is a, a, a pathologizing of women who have, have, have been at the receiving end of serious abuse and, uh, and instead of approaching it from the point of view of what the the, um, the, the, the offender the, uh, the, you know, has done, um, looking at uh, examining you and examining the, the complainant, and it's just, uh, I mean, you would agree with that, Charlotte? Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to share with you, um, I had two cases recently where the women were diagnosed with um, histrionic personality disorders. You can see nods. Uh, which means in a person with histrionic personality disorder, the self-esteem depends on the approval of others. People with this disorder, disorder uh, have an overwhelming desire to be noticed, behave dramatically or inappropriately to get attention. I've never seen a man diagnosed with histrionic personality disorder. It's the most sexist and misogynist term linked to that can be used. You know, the, the business of the womb, you know. The womb, uh, yeah. I mean, we, we know from the 1980s, 1800s, women used to have clitoridectomies to cure lesbianism, hysteria. And now it's been trotted out in the courts. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to thank you for that because you've raised a, a really important element in all of this, which is that way of, of attacking and undermining women. Um, there's a gentleman over there. Yes, would you like to come in? Um, I want to let him not very good anywhere. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so well, I mean, I've got. Uh, 
Finnish system is quite good. So in, in Finland, they actually have the clinical psychologists that are working with the victims in child abuse investigations and um, looking at the evidence and, and working very much with the courts and legal systems. It's very different. And it's them that provide the, the testimony, not the police on, on the evidence, which I think is a really good system. Oh, yeah, and I just... Um, I look to... Um, examples of countries, and there's only a handful of them around the world where, and it's all pretty recent, where they've made a modification to their law, so you have now affirmative consent laws in place. Most recently, New South Wales um, in, in Australia have implemented those. Spain um, is a country where, um, following the absolutely horrendous um, rape of uh, a woman in Pamplona, where the, you know, they run the bulls, there was, there was the wolf pack, these five, five or six, five five or six men yeah. Raped, raped uh, this woman, and, and there was a massive, massive, massive outpouring. This depresses me that it often takes a case of that horror and that magnitude to precipitate the change towards that kind of adjustment to the statute. But in our country, we do have consent-based laws, but in law, and you guys can help me if I get some of this slight, if I garble it a little, um, here in the UK, the way it works is that um, the person who's been accused uh, if, they're a, if they have reasonable belief that she consented, then that kind of works in their favor. Now, I think this concept of reasonable belief is deeply problematic in a society where men feel entitled to women's bodies and entitled to sex, and misogyny is just so pervasive. So if you made an adjustment to that, you could change the line of inquiry from, did she say no, this is just keeping things super simple, to did she say yes? And what steps did you take to ascertain whether she really wanted to be strangled um, in that way? What steps did you take and what that does is it kind of like shifts. It doesn't solve everything. The law ain't going to save us. But what it does, I think, is it changes the balance of power. Yeah. And there are countries in the world, as I say, Spain most recently, um, a couple of places in Australia, New South Wales, Victoria following on, um, Sweden have it also. And the Women's Equality Party, won't surprise you, is campaigning for that here in, in Britain. Honey, and one of the things, when I'm asked this stuff, um, when, I'm, when I'm speaking to a, an audience and, and I'm talking about um, how, you, how, how men should think about this, um, I mean, I, I, I think that it's, it's, it's unlikely that we're going to have people sort of, you know, I don't know if any of you saw the program last night with Kirsty Wark and others in a, in a house who were sort of... A group Womanhood, of, a, I think? A group of women who were... It was, I can't remember, it's called Women... Womanhood, I think. Women, I and, it, and it was basically um, looking at all of this stuff that we're talking about. And... Uh, uh, and they were talking about, well, you know, should there be, should people have an app on their phone where they can, you can sort of, you know, nobody's going to end up, but, you know, the whole fun of sex, because sex can be fun when it's consensual, it's mutually respectful, where it's about enjoyable intimacy with somebody that you, you know, like being with and caring about and all that. But, um, but the business about it is, is that, I mean, I just think you have to be all the time, and our sons and our men folk have to think about this, is you have to be saying, is this okay? Is this okay? Is this okay? It's not complicated. You just say, is this okay? Making sure that the person is saying, actually, I don't particularly like that, or no. And to be listening to what the other person is saying. We have to teach people about, about what good sex is like and what respectful and, and relationships are like and about how, you, how, you, how that can be between anybody, whoever, whoever, whoever the couplings So like. yeah, even if we did have a change in law of that kind, it would have to be accompanied by education and the type of sort of programming and possibly propaganda, you know, that actually helps people understand what consent really looks like and how I might consent today, that doesn't mean you got a season ticket to my body. We need to change the norms around how we relate to each other in this regard. And that doesn't happen if you just make a change to what's on the statute. It is a much broader and bigger project than that. Yeah, well it's, it's about seeing it across the criminal justice system, so better training for the police, more resources, more funding, also for the CPS. And then judges need training as well, and juries need to know that stereotypes Tell me about and tropes. It. It's really yeah, hard to get to judges. Um, <laughs> it's really hard to get to yeah. judges. It's very interesting the business about tra trying to train judges because, and yeah. this, is, this, is the this is the world over, yeah. which is yeah. that there's this business which is about. Um, the status that the judges um, enjoy and the idea that they're independent and therefore they don't want to be taught anything. They think that it somehow yeah. is going to undermine their sort of, yeah. uh, their ideas yeah. being the seat of wisdom. 
and, uh, and they've got a hell of a lot to learn. Yeah. And, uh, and there has to be far better training, there really does. But when we try to introduce it into the domestic abuse bill oh, yeah. in Parliament, they absolutely it was resisted. No, nope. I, I helped to draft that, and uh, yeah. the resistance was yeah. phenomenal, which to me said was, more about. It was shocking. More, said more about the government, the actual amendment. Yeah. You know, we tried to introduce judicial training on uh, rape, domestic use, and coercive yeah. and controlling behaviour. They were having none of it. They said yeah. it would be unconstitutional, yet they uh, curtail judicial it review it laws. Was interfering with the independence of the judiciary. I mean, exactly, it was, it yeah. Was it was just mm. ridiculous. Yeah. Anyway, um, I've got only got five minutes more, and there's a hand there, and there are more hands. So come on. Yeah, I think it is more complex. I mean, it is obviously a multidisciplinary approach, but I think the thing that's more, more problematic is confirmation bias, which is that I think that's something that really needs to be addressed, that, that entering the um, interview room even before they've met the victim with an assumption that there isn't going to be any evidence or there's a reason why this victim um, has given consent but is bringing the case forward, and we've heard about, just had one example of that. So I think... Um, in terms of selection, um, I think there is a problem that um, there, there isn't enough specialist support and they always say we don't have enough specialist uh, police officers to work with sexual victims. I think that's just an excuse. I, think some, I, I don't think it's so much that they identify. I think it's, it's just they have, have difficulty putting their biases to one side, um, and they'll say that I'm not biased, but we know this, these can operate at an unconscious level and affect their decision making. They're still looking for, I have been fortunate enough to work with the Scottish Judiciary um, and uh, the Judicial Studies uh, Committee where the Justices of Peace, who are often retired professionals, not very representative society, but goodwill, and they'll say to me, you know, what we're looking for are what can tell us whether somebody's lying or telling the truth? And I'm like, there are no clear indicators. And yet people are looking for that. They're like, this victim doesn't seem to be displaying any emotion. So well, it doesn't... They might be traumatised. Yeah. That, that doesn't yeah. enter it. So I think, in a way, sometimes it's the opposite. It's not understanding enough about how somebody who's traumatised might come across rather than empathising. I think it's more likely to be not having that knowledge to understand or not being able to transfer control to the victim or the witness because they're the ones that have the information this idea that you have to be as the investigator have to be in charge and to do all the talking well, isn't I'm, just, I'm just going to as a scott ask you what were you suggesting that, that you got a better that you had a better run at things in scotland <laughs> i definitely had a better run of things in scotland i got my foot in the door yeah, i you're very good okay yeah. i'm glad to hear yeah. it <laughs> anyway uh somebody else you must have a, there's another hand there Yes, that'd be great. Come on in, I haven't had Alex in for a while, come on. Yes, 
um, but, more, but, but actually, I think rape is already treated as a different crime. So we, yes, you're saying it's a different crime, but actually it's already treated differently, which is why you see the low rates of conviction, which mustn't be forgotten. I think that one of the ways in which to be radical about it is actually to not treat it as a different crime and to treat it as you would any other violent crime against the person. And that means taking it out of its relationship with stigma and with shame and with treating it as something which um, is like any other violent crime. So you would treat that seriously. You would, you would, you would encounter somebody, a complainant, um, from a position of a priori belief that they're telling the truth because you know, it's a violent crime that's ha that has happened to them. And then all of the rest of this that we're talking about, the reluctance to, of, uh, of um, at every step of the way along the criminal justice system to take cases forward because maybe the, because the evidence isn't, isn't necessarily 100% going to be sufficiently believable, because actually maybe this person's making it up in order to get attention because they're histrionic, because of all these other, th these other inventions, if you want, to, which are put in the way as barriers to um, uh, convicting people of the crime of rape, including the shame of being labelled a sex offender and a rapist and, and juries reluctant to do that to somebody. So yes, it is already treated differently. It could be treated as something which was more normal. That's not to say that it's like less of a horrific and violating and humiliating crime, but if it was taken out of its relationship with shame and stigma, then it could be that you could have a different transformative outcome um, in, that, in that context. There is an interesting issue though there, which is that, um, is that the reason why the standard is high in criminal cases is because of the punishment that follows. And, and one of the things that the women's movement has done is, is keeping asking for, you know, the, the offence to be treated more and more seriously. And, uh, and therefore, once you start saying that, you, you, you know, that this kind of crime should carry with it a really heavy sentence um, and that it's taking a whole big chunk out of somebody's life, um, and we, men and women both, I hope, um, uh, add, you know, give value to the business of freedom and to our liberty. So what do, w what do we do about that, about the way in which we punish um, uh, this, uh, uh, this behavior, this, this crime? Um, and, and if you are going to punish, and that means jailing and taking someone's liberty from them, which is, you know, that's a serious thing to do to a human being, then, you know, in the same way that it's serious to rape somebody, um, you have to have a way of judging that that is setting us a reasonably high bar. So, you know, I mean, in all of this, I've always worried about um, uh, the women's movement simply responding to serious um, uh, violation by calling for just jailing people. Um, because I think, it, I think that in itself is, is, becomes problematic. And so, you, you know, if you want to have a radical rethink about it, then you'd have to think, well, is it that we think that, the, that jailing is the only way of dealing with this? Or are there other ways in which you could deal with this kind of offending and this kind of sense of entitlement and the ways in which it's about power, ultimately? So, you know, I mean, I think there is a much more complicated, you know, debate in all of this. Um, and, um, and I do think that, uh, you know, simply thinking, well, let's just deal with it as if it were a civil matter with a lower standard of proof. You can jail lots of people that way, but you will have lots of miscarriages of justice too, I think. I, I mean, yeah. I see... That's the risk. I mean, you, you mentioned the family courts. Just have a look at what's happening in the family courts. It's even worse in the criminal justice system. There are probably more convictions for rape than there are findings of rape in the family courts, even though it's on the balance of probabilities. There was a case called H&N, which was published in March this year, Court of Appeal case. I represented two of the four appellants, amazing mothers, uh, that said that they had been raped. And the way that the family court dealt with that was just, I mean, it was archaic. They said in one case that even though a woman didn't enjoy it, she didn't want to have sex, but she felt it was her duty as a wife. No recognition, of course, of any intersexual inequality she might have been experiencing or suffering with. Uh, it was still uh, consensual sex. And they also used her sexual history against her, and the judge said that she was no shrinking violet. Uh, that was actually in the judgment, no shrinking violet. So we have a long way to go in the family courts, where, of course, hands up all the judgments are private. Hands up, shrinking out there. Put your hand up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Thank, yeah, it's shocking. I mean, it was shocking. I think we could have a discussion about restorative justice if we wanted to, but I think that's not... No, I think... I, think I, that's, I was going to mention that. That is another alternative. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, but that is another yeah. alternative in terms of... Because people who rape are also a product of the culture in which such a thing yeah. is normalised. Yeah. So, yeah. like, it's putting... And actually, as a criminologist, we tend to think we should not have people in prison if we're on... Like, yeah. it is something which we are critical of in, as, from, a, like, a disciplinary research perspective. So, actually, other solutions should be explored, including the, the principle of, of counselling, restorative justice and actually the whole the whole because I'm saying that basically all of this is under is underpinned by um, rape culture you have to transform culture we're talking about exactly. that the, the, it's it's small it's incremental it's really slow but actually that also means recognizing that people who rape are not d didn't uh, are not usually waking up that day thinking oh this is it. I'm gonna be a rapist today they are a product of the culture and the position from which they themselves are and so having more recognition of that and how to transform that opens up possibilities for something different to happen. Uh, 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 but that's why it does have to be a much wider conversation, because sexual violence is, in my view, one of the ultimate expressions of inequality between men and women. And so we have to have a program of work that actually closes down um, that inequality and moves us towards a world where um, women and girls are truly equal citizens to men and boys. And, you know, we, let's say we even improve, let's say we crank things up and, we, and we're convicting the majority. We got 100,000 jail places a year, you know, for, for all of these rapists. So in a way, I totally get that we have a dysfunction in the criminal justice system, but the bigger project and the thing that is going to make life better for all of us is zooming in on the inequality and making sure that all the ways that manifests is tackled. And then we can actually make progress in ways that we would all want to see over the next decade and generations that follow. Um, I want to thank, thank you for, for reminding us. There is a, a, bigger, a bigger issue out there. And uh, I think it's been one of the, our mistakes uh, in, for the women's movement to keep just saying, you know, this is happening to us. You know, let's be more and more punitive and so on, and not getting to the actual uh, root cause, which is the misogyny, the, the, the patriarchal society that we live in, and its manifestations in misogynistic uh, conduct. And uh, I, I really do think that there is a much bigger sort of debate, and the next time we all come together, that's, that's what we have to be talking yeah. about. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry your hand's up, but I can't bring you in because I'm given the notice, <laughs> the time is up. Anyway, I want to thank my panel. Would you join me in thanking my panel? And I want to thank all of you for being a great audience, attentive, interesting, and, uh, and supportive of uh, people talking about difficult things. Thank you very much. Bye.